We're now going to read um, God's Word. We're going to be reading our last part of Ephesians. Can you believe it? If you've been journeying with us, um, I can't believe we're at the end. Um, So Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to the end. If you're looking for that in a a physical Bible, it's, it's nearer the back of the Bible. So it reads, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Titus will tell you everything. He is a dear brother and a faithful minister in the Lord. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are and to encourage your hearts. Peace be to the whole community and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Now just going to invite Jeb to come and speak to us. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed these talks from Ephesians over these past couple of months and the discussions in your life groups which have followed. As Leslie said, this was the the last one in the series this morning with our reading bringing us to the end of the book. You can catch up with any of the talks that you may have missed or would like to listen to a second time on the church website or the church YouTube channel. So I hope over these weeks and months that we've caught something of Ephesians' energy and excitement that characterizes the good news that was flourishing there in Ephesus. New life in Christ, adopted into God's family, reconciled to people from whom we were previously separated. We've thought about what it means to be Christ's body, And connected to this, how we should then behave at home, in the workplace, in the church, leaving our old sinful patterns behind and expressing the new life that we've received. All of which is great. But, unfortunately, there's an enemy whose goal it is to disrupt and destroy this new community that God has formed in Christ. And in chapter 6, this portion we've read this morning, the means for resisting and overcoming this threat are explained. It's important to say, I think, that this is not some abstract theoretical discussion removed from everyday experience. It's practical advice about how our faith in Jesus and the relationships that come with that and our ability to share this good news with others 
can stand up to real challenges and, should it come, opposition as well. The battles that the passage speaks about are not ones where we need to take up arms. There's no call here for violence or vigilantism and you know, it's to our, our shared regret that sometimes in the past people claiming to be Christians have, have done that. But that's not what's being asked for here, thankfully. This is because the struggle, as it's described, occurs in heavenly places. And that phrase, heavenly places, is a backbone of Ephesians. It's used five times. We're going to use the screen a little this morning, um, and I'll put these slides in the life group notes as well. So if we can just move the camera round to the screen, we'll think for a moment about what we mean by heavenly places. So the phrase heavenly places occurs five times in Ephesians. First of all, we're told that God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. These heavenly places are where Christ is seated and he's supreme there. He's the, um, yes, he's the Lord in, the, in those heavenly places. We know that God, who's rich in mercy, has seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. And grace, God's grace, is given to the church so that the church should make God's wisdom known in the heavenly places. And then, as we just said about the nature of our struggle, it's not against blood and flesh, but it's against the spiritual forces of evil. And these operate in the heavenly places. So the idea, simply put, is that there's this place, heavenly places, where there's spiritual activity. And here, in this, this location, good and evil are in conflict. The good news is that Jesus is exalted far above any other power or force that's at work in this environment. And people who are in Christ, Christians, have received those spiritual blessings that are mentioned through Ephesians. And through their transformed lives, they're to make God's wisdom, the wisdom of the cross and the resurrection, known. But these heavenly places are a site of battle. God's enemies don't want the proclamation of God's wisdom to flourish with more people following Jesus. That's why it meets resistance. So we've one more slide, so we'll just go to that and then we'll, we'll come back to me. So how do these battles play out? I find it useful to think about this using three circles, beginning at an individual, personal level, there being some kind of battle there, before moving out to thinking about the battle at a collective sort of church-wide level, and then finally thinking of it at a whole community or society level. So as I say, I'll put those slides in the life group notes if you want to refer to them a second time. So beginning with what was the first circle in my diagram, this individual level, engaging in this battle involves, begins with seeing ourselves to follow the military metaphor in relation to our commanding officer. In those words that, um, that Leslie read, excuse me, I've just lost my place. In those words that, that Leslie read, we're to recognize and place ourselves under Christ's authority. As the passage begins, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. So our strength and confidence are not in ourselves, they're in Christ. So we can do this, we can we can put our um, desire for strength, requests for strength, when we pray together or privately and affirm our devotion to the Lord, confessing our shortcomings, receiving his grace. This is how we stand in his strength. Now, the importance of this relationship is emphasized by a story in Acts where, which took place actually in Ephesus when the church was being founded there. In Acts 19, you may recall, Paul was performing miracles and exercising demons, 
using the authority of Christ. And some local exorcists, the sons of Sceva they were called, they think they can do the same, like this is a magic formula. But because they were not under Christ's authority, it didn't work and they were humiliated. They were given a hiding. And this reminds us that we're Christ's servants and not the other way around. Therefore, being strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power is the first step towards standing firm in our faith. One of the repeated phrases in our reading, to stand, to stand firm when the evil day comes, to stand. And this enables us to not only stand, but also to repel the powers of darkness, God's enemies that seek to destroy and undermine the wisdom of God. The tools at our disposal are called the armour of God. And the items in the, uh, in the kit list, if you like, correspond to what a Roman soldier would have had in the first century. So included with the slides, I'll put in the life group notes, you may have seen a picture there of a Roman, army, uh, Roman soldier sorry, togged up in his breastplate and with um, a holster for his sword and so on. So I'll provide a bit more information about that. In another New Testament letter, Paul uses the phrase that we should clothe ourselves with Christ. And I find this is a good way to think about the armour, not just as useful things that God may give us, but that Christ himself is the armour and the different pieces correspond to some aspect of who he is or what he has done, truth righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, the word of God. And by virtue of being clothed in him, covered in him, his qualities can become the characteristics that mark us as we speak his truth, behave in ways that are right, build each other up, challenge injustice, share the good news of what Jesus has done for us. This sense of being covered in Christ gives us the resilience to respond in faith when the challenges come. So that's something of the individual level. But then moving to that second circle in my diagram, at the collective level, as I said earlier, the enemy's goal is to disrupt and destroy the new community that God has formed in Christ. There's nothing the devil loves more than Christians fighting each other. It saves him a job and it div diverts our attention from more important things. An illustration of this is in chapter four of Ephesians, if we just think back to a little earlier in the letter. And that chapter is particularly about unity and it emphasizes that we must not be untruthful with each other. And the reason given, I always think, is interesting. It's not, it's not that lying is wrong. That's not the reason. I mean, lying is wrong. But that's not the reason that's given. But it's because we're members of one another. Do not lie because you're members of each other. And what we do in the body of the church affects the health of the church as a whole, it affects our relationships. So things like bending the truth flattering each other, being deceitful, damages Christian communities and gives the devil a foothold. I think it's verse 27 or 28 where Paul says, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't, don't allow him to get that toehold that will allow him to cause havoc. So we need to guard against these things and nurture truthful relationships. This military language, I think, is really, really helpful. Comradeship, we might say. People with whom we're fully transparent, perhaps to whom we hold ourselves accountable in areas where we may struggle, and to whom we look for prayer and support. That's one example of how we can engage, if you like, in constructive um, warfare, if that's a term you're comfortable with, to resist the devil. The belt of truth, as the first piece of armour mentioned, is the one around which all the other pieces fit. Being truthful, truthful with one another and focusing on Jesus, who is the truth, ensures we can work and serve as a unit under the Lord's leadership. 
So that's the collective level. And then you'll recall from the slide there was a third circle, an outer circle, at society level. And just coming to that now, the world in which we live is bigger than ourselves or our Christian friends. And this idea of battle is concerned as well with wider society and the greater good, the kingdom of God, we might say, which Jesus proclaimed. And it's right there in the Lord's Prayer, which we say often, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what goes on in those heavenly places that we thought about briefly does play out in government and corporate decisions and institutional behavior that affects societies across the world. We've been praying this past week for Christians across the globe who are persecuted for their faith. And this is one example among many of how many, many governments oppress dissent. And it's a spiritual matter. It is a political matter, but it's not just a political matter. It's a spiritual matter. Economics is spiritual too. Challenging, for example, the demand for cheap goods in the West, which we all benefit from and enjoy. Challenging that is done by people who wear a breastplate of righteousness, I think. People who stand up for those who in, in often, not all situations, but often in Asian factories might be on low wages might be mistreated in order to service our huge demand. This is an aspect of spiritual warfare, standing up for what is right. We thank God for that. And also, can we, can we deny that people who refuse perhaps to accept legitimate election results or alter national constitutions to preserve their own positions is this behavior not driven by spiritual forces of evil? I think it is, and these are issues to be resisted and challenged. Now, we cannot personally fix every one of these injustices. However, the way we pray, the spending decisions we make, the content of, and the manner of opinions we express on social media, all these things are connected to what goes on in the heavenly places. And to follow this language of battle, they contribute to the advance or the retreat of the Christian community and the gospel of forgiveness and reconciliation that is our battle standard. So whether we're thinking individually, collectively, or about society as a whole, the most important thing we can do in this battle beginning at verse 17, is to pray, to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying in the Spirit at all times with every prayer and supplication, always, as it says, persevering for all the saints, and for Paul it was him, but for others now, to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. So we ask, as we consider this passage, as we come to the conclusion of our series on Ephesians, that the Holy Spirit would inspire and guide our praying, that we deftly and accurately handle the scriptures, that we'd say and do the things that keep us strong, standing firm in Christ and advancing his gospel. So as we come to the conclusion of our talk now, Let's just take a few moments. If you're at home, you may want to change position or ad adopt a posture of prayer. And let's just think about for a few moments some of the, the thoughts I've brought out this morning or previous things that have caught your attention through, um, through our study of Ephesians and ask the Lord to speak to us, to minister to us. Perhaps that thing about truth and our relationships is something we could address. Maybe we've let the devil gain a foothold in some way and we need to take corrective action or perhaps some other 
aspect of our, our studies and, and discussions have brought things to your mind. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would just stir within us now that which you are um, wanting, to, wanting to stir. Lord, through all that Jeb's shared, just pinpoint that thing that you want us to work on. It might be that God is really highlighting an issue for you that you that is really on your heart to stand up for what is right. It might be something that he's calling you to pray for. It might be something that he's calling you to act on and support in, in some kind of practical way. Just reminded of that, um, there's a line in, in one of the songs that we, we sing, break my heart for what breaks yours. I just get a sense that there might be some things that the Spirit is breaking our hearts for. And I just want to uh, briefly reiterate the importance of bringing ourselves before the Lord regularly to receive his strength and that idea that the relationship between the commanding officer and those in the commanding officer's service it's uh, so easy to forget Lord I pray that that's the, the posture we have before you every day mm. yes, Lord.